All right, y'all. I'm live on Facebook right now. So I'm checking my Facebook page to be sure the live video is coming up. If you don't um, see me or hear me, you have to let me know. Oh, this video is there. Okay. 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 All right. All right. Good. I'm live. Okay. Okay. I got to tell a few more people that I'm live. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, y'all. I'm live on Facebook right now. Good. Okay. Not good. There we go. Because that's going to give me some feedback, I know. So I just want to be sure it was coming through. Okay, great. So I'm a little bit early. I'm going to give people time to get here. Because I know that when I come on late, y'all think I'm not coming. <laughs> so we have to fix that now, don't we? Oh, man. I just found out Chick Corea died. I did not know he had died. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Yeah, this is breaking news. It just happened. Wow. He's one of the best humans of all time. Wow, I did not know he had passed. Wow. That's a poor man. People are just leaving here. People are leaving here, let me tell you. Okay. All right, I'm going to start right at 7. My clock has 6.59. Come on. Posting a picture on that. Uh, that post I just made. Because that is quite a blow. The man was truly a living legend. Truly a living legend. That's no exaggeration. Wow. 
All right, let me get out of that. All right, seven o'clock, so we're going to get started. I want to let people come on when they come on. Okay, <clears throat> I say a word of prayer and we're going to jump right in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, for your kindness and for continuing to shower your blessings upon us, oh God. Please, sir, give me for saying anything by thought, one of these, but I've sinned against your God. And please fill me with the Holy Ghost. Oh God, please breathe through me and speak through me. Oh God, and use me for your glory because I'm but clay and you're the creator. So let your truth be breathed through me. And I thank you for it. And I believe you for it. And let what you want said to be said tonight in this broadcast as we take a deep dive into names and foundation. And I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this teaching and all that receiving and apply to their lives. Mm, yea, less than even in 24 hours, they will see miraculous works begin to manifest in their life because of this teaching. I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, I got one, do one more thing, hold on. So first I need to give you a little background, then we can dive right in. <clears throat> now for those of you that don't know what No More Genies is, <clears throat> I encourage you to go back to the beginning. You can find the videos uh, on my Facebook page, uh, Prophet David Taylor on Facebook. You can find it on my YouTube channel as well. You can always look me up with the hashtag PDT or hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG. No More Genies is about leaving our genie concept of God and <clears throat> getting into what the word really says and getting to know who God is as a person. And once again, relating to him based on what he said in his word, because you can't make God honor something he didn't say. And God is under no obligation to honor our program. He honors his word. And so there's so much Christian myth and so much Christian misinformation and so much stuff that's been around for so long that has taught people all the wrong thing. And so we need to dispel that. We need to get away from that. We need to get away from this concept of God that says somehow he's a genie. Sometimes somehow he's just, you know, a big old Santa Claus or wish granter and that, you know, all we have to do is rub the magic lamp or say the magic word and we get all our wishes granted. That's not who God is and his kingdom doesn't work that way. But there's so much bad teaching out there, which leads me to the next part. The next part is if you missed the lesson of 2020, and I did a video on that a couple of weeks ago, if you missed the lesson of 2020, God just took his mighty hand and tore down all the religious stuff we were doing. All the religious stuff we were doing is gone. It's not ever coming back because God just tore it down. So if you survive 2020, it would be foolish for us to go through all that. The entire world has changed and the world is never going to be what it was. So it is foolish from this point moving forward to try to build up something that God just got through tearing down. All that religious stuff we were doing, all the denominationalism, the separation, the things that kept, it, kept us apart as a body of Christ, the racism, all those things, God just tore all that down, okay? Clearly because he wasn't pleased with it because now most folks can't even go to church. That doesn't tell you anything. And so those of us that survived 2020 have made it into the new year. We now have a historic opportunity, a historic opportunity. We now have a historic opportunity to build something that the Lord would be pleased with. We now have an historic opportunity to throw down once and for all, all the religious things, all the traditions of men, all the bad teaching, all the, the wrong doctrine that had plagued us for so long and actually build and lay a foundation that's biblical and that's right. 
to develop in the way God wants us to develop. So we have a chance for a new start. We have a chance going forward. Whenever God leaves you alive after a global judgment, then he, you know, just like he did the same thing to Noah, he put Noah in the same position that Adam was in. He told Noah the same thing he told Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, fill it, subdue it, and have dominion. So in other words, Adam messed up and then we messed up so badly, God had to wipe all that out and start over with Noah. But he gave Noah the original commands that he gave to Adam. So what does that mean? That means that now we as the church in the 21st century have a chance to build according to what God actually says and do what the word actually says. That is why people stop coming to church because they couldn't get the truth in church. When you go to the grocery store, you want some groceries. When you go to the schoolhouse, you want some academic education. When you go to the church house, you're supposed to get the truth of God. And that ain't what we was doing. We were doing hat parade and chicken sale and denominationalism and smoke and mirrors and and you know who had the biggest house and who had the hottest worship team and who had the hottest worship leader and who was doing the latest songs and who was the most famous and how many people go to your church and a whole bunch of stuff that don't mean nothing about nothing. Where are the miracles? Where's the healing of the sick? When the Lord walked to earth as a man, he healed all manner of diseases. Uh, it, the Bible says divers diseases. Divers is an old English word that means various. So in other words, no matter what they were afflicted with, whether it was mental, emotional, physical, they brought it to Jesus. And the Bible says every time that he healed them all. OK, he healed them all, casting out demons, breaking unclean spirits off of someone's life. So they no longer have to live in demonic oppression, raising the dead because the Lord did that several times, taking somebody that had passed on and bringing them back out here, bringing them back to life. He did that with Jairus' daughter because one version says she was already dead. He did that for the funeral he interrupted for the little girl who he said, Talitha Kumi, uh, I say to the damsel arise. He did that for Lazarus, probably his most famous raising of the dead. And of course he resurrected himself from the dead. Where are the Christians doing that? Now, no, we can't resurrect ourselves, but we can raise other dead people. Where are Christians doing that? Where are Christians that are having services or anything that says, no matter what your ailment, no matter what your disease, no matter what is troubling you mentally, emotionally, physically, Jesus Christ can heal you right now and you've become 100% whole. Where is that? He did financial miracles. He multiplied food to feed 4,000 men plus the women and children. So that means 4,000 plus people. And then he did that again, where this time it was 5,000 men, 5,000 men plus the women and children. So 5,000 plus people. Because a lot of people don't know the Lord actually did that twice. Most people talk about the miracle of 5,000, but he did it with 4,000 men too. That's not less of a miracle just because it was a thousand less people. Where are people doing that? He did uh, financial miracles with Peter. He pulled money out of the fish's mouth to pay Peter's taxes and the Lord's taxes. He gave Peter a, a boat, a net breaking boatload of fish because <clears throat> he told Peter, Peter had been working all night and he told Peter to cast his net on the right side and Peter got so much fish, the net started to break and on and on and on. Where is that? Where is that in modern day Christianity? Where is that? Where, where is that? Okay. Uh, where is the apostolic and the prophetic? So what we have a chance now to do is to apostolically and prophetically lay a foundation of good teaching and good doctrine that's based on the actual scripture that you can prove out yourself. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, you can prove it out yourself. Because remember, you don't have to listen to the words of a prophet if the words don't come to pass. Okay, that's the test of every prophet. That's in the scripture. Does what he says, he or she says, come to pass? And what they say don't come to pass, and God said they spoke presumptuously, and you don't have to listen to them. Okay? So all this teaching I'm going to do tonight, all this prophesying I'm going to do tonight, you can actually prove it out in your life. That means you can test it and see if it's true. Does it work? Is it true? Does it work for you? Because if it does, then it's something you can build on. You understand that? All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do in these next four more genies, uh, the next four teachings, but tonight's going to be part one. I'm going to do a four part series called Who is God? And the reason we want to start there is because, well, let me look this up and give this to you because I have all those other scriptures ready, but it didn't look that one up. Uh, 
And I want to be sure I give you scripture for all of it. Okay. The Lord said this in more than one place. But uh, I'm looking at Matthew 22, 36, 37, 38. Matthew 22, 36, 37, 38. Somebody asked Jesus, teacher, which commandment is the greatest in the law? Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's Matthew 22, 22, 37. Okay. In Luke 10, 26, 27, and 28. Luke 10, 26, 27, 28. What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That's Luke 10 and 27. Now in Matthew, the Lord said that here, the Lord is responding to a question from the crowd. The Lord says, how does the law read to you? And the man that asked the question said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the Lord said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So whether it was a quote from Jesus or Jesus responding to the question, what the Lord said was that the first commandment is to love the Lord. And how are you supposed to love the Lord? You're supposed to love the Lord with all that you have, with all your heart. That's both your emotional center and your spirit, man with all your soul, that's your mind, will, and emotions, with all your strength, that's your body, and with your mind, that's your thoughts, okay? So in other words, there's no part of you that God doesn't want you to love him with, okay? And this is the first and the great commandment. Now, whenever the Bible says something is first, <laughs> then it is shown up first, and you have to pay attention to it. That's why so many people get in trouble because they're out of order. Where the Lord says that is again in Matthew 22, uh, 22, Matthew 22, verse 38. This is the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then Luke says, with all your strength, that's your body too. This is the first and greatest commandment. So if the Lord says something is first, that means we are foolish to do a whole bunch of other things, but we don't do the first thing. That means we're out of order. And if you get out of order, eventually whatever it is you're doing is going to collapse. It doesn't matter what else you're doing if you're out of order. It's going to fall down. It's going to collapse. So if the Lord said the first and the greatest, he said this is the first and the greatest. Again, Matthew 22, verse 38. This is the first and greatest commandment. So the Lord said, loving him with all that we have, with all your being, is first, most important, before principle. He also says it's the greatest. That means it's the largest. It's in the wide end sense. It has the preeminence. That's the first thing. So let me ask you a question. In all your years of going to church, did you learn how to love the Lord more? Do you feel like you love the Lord more after your church experience than you did before? Do you feel like you know God better? Do you feel like you know God as a person? Or do you know that you know? Because the Lord says, my sheep know my voice. Or did you learn a bunch of religious things? Did you learn a bunch of form and fashion? See, so we got to go back and we got to do the first thing. So what I'm going to spend these next four teachings doing, my next four No More Genies, is I'm going to uh, talk about who is God. And I'm putting that in the chat. And I'm going to put that on the screen. I'm going to talk about who is God. And what I'm going to do in these lessons is I'm going to give you biblical principles on who God is and how to get to know him. One more time. Biblical principles on who God is and how you can get to know him. Okay. And so I'm going to give you several principles per session. Then I'm going to give you scriptures and then we're going to have extrapolated principles from those scriptures. But uh, so you can have a foundation a foundation for knowing and loving the Lord your God. Because the Lord said that's the first thing and that's the greatest commandment. So uh, one more time, we're foolish to move forward as a church, as a body of Christ, and we're not doing the first thing, okay? All right, so we're gonna jump on in and I think I'm gonna go ahead on and put the scriptures on the screen. I'm gonna put them in the chat, but I'm gonna put them on the screen 
so you can see them. So if anybody that watches the replay, you can see which scripture I'm talking about as well. So let me do that with the ones I just quoted to you. So the ones I just quoted to you, is Matthew 22, 36 through 39. That's the one where it talks about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So that's the one I just got through reading to you, and I will also give you the other one. The other one I quoted from was Luke. Okay? Uh, and that was Luke chapter 10, verses 26 through 28. So Luke chapter 10. 26 through 28. Okay. All these are in the chat if you're watching me on Facebook Live, but I'm also putting them on the screen. So those of you that watch the replay again can have the scriptures. Okay. So that's what I'm talking about. The first thing that's our foundation. So now let's look at some principles about who God is. Okay. Principle number one. God's love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. And our scripture reference for that is Romans 5 and 8. Okay. God's love is unconditional. What does that mean? Well, let's look at Romans 5 and 8. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God proves, or the King James says, God commends or demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Brian study Bible, God proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. King James Bible, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean in the practical sense? Okay. In a practical sense, what that means is that God's love is not based on how we act. I'm gonna revisit that principle later, but God's love is not based on how we act, okay? God sent Christ, Father God sent Christ to die for us and Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That means it wasn't based on our condition. It wasn't based on our goodness. It wasn't based on how we were living because we were living in sin. But Father gave the Son, and the Son gave his life. And then the Son, when he resurrected and ascended, sent back the Holy Ghost so we wouldn't have to be alone. Okay? None of that is based on how we act. It is without condition. Okay? You don't have to qualify for God's love. He already loves you. Now, let me hasten to say what people have done is they have taken the unconditional love of God and said that that means, because God loves me without condition, that I can live any kind of way I want to. And wrong, that's false, that's incorrect, that's not the truth, okay? It's not <clears throat> that God's unconditional love means, because what they're trying to say is that God's unconditional love means unconditional acceptance. That means that anything you offer up to God, he'll just accept because he loves you. That is not what unconditional love is. It does not mean unconditional acceptance. It means acceptance in any condition. It means it doesn't matter how high, how low, how wide, how thin, how constricted. It doesn't matter what state you're in. God loves you. That's what it means. Acceptance in any condition, not unconditional acceptance of behavior. And why is that important? Well, what if somebody came in your house and they brought their dog and their dog tore up all your furniture and their dog messed all over your living room or your bed? Would you say, well, that's okay, because I love you? <laughs> no, you would not. I don't care who that, do that, did that to you, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your son, or your daughter, the people that you love the most. If they did that, brought their dog in your house, and that dog tore up all your furniture and messed over your bedroom, you would not be okay with that. So, <laughs> so no matter how much you love them, it does not mean that any behavior that they do is okay. And that's how people have tried to twist the unconditional love of God and make it say that because God loves me, that means I can just do whatever I want. That is not what that means. 
That's not what that means. It does not mean unconditional acceptance of behavior. It means acceptance in any condition. It means it doesn't matter how high you rise or how low you sink. It doesn't matter what state you're in. God loves you. And that's the end of the conversation, period, dot. He loves you. He loves you because he's good, not because we're good, okay? So that's principle number one, that God's love is unconditional. Here comes number two, God's favor is unmerited. God's favor is unmerited. Romans five, I'm gonna read that to you, one and two. Okay. Let's read Romans five, one and two. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, about whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just told you that you stand in grace. You stand in the grace of God because you're justified by faith through Jesus Christ. Now, what justification by faith in Christ means, long story short, is that God takes Jesus' righteousness and applies it to your account. So first God takes Jesus' blood, his shed pure innocent blood, and wipes your sins off your account. Then God takes Jesus' righteousness and puts his righteousness on your account, and God justifies you or realigns you. Like you justify a block of text on a Word document, God realigns you rightly with him, and God counts you righteous. So if you want to remember what justified means, it means just as if you'd never sinned. So God applies Jesus's righteousness to your life and counts you just as if you never sinned. Good God Almighty, this is getting good to me, okay? And God did that through no merit of your own. <laughs> In other words, you didn't have to earn it. It's unmerited favor. Father God gives you the favor of Christ through faith. He gives it to you by you believing it. You don't have to earn it, okay? So it's unmerited favor. It's the favor of Christ given to you, okay? Father sees you through the eyes of Christ. He sees you through the eyes of Jesus, all right? Uh, let me uh, show you this other scripture. Uh, we're gonna read Ephesians 1, two through eight. So let me put that on the screen so you know what I'm reading. Ephesians 1, two through eight. Ephesians 1, 2 through 8. I'm, I'm going to read that now. Reading out the NIV, New International Version. Ephesians 1, 2 through 8. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Let me ask you a question. How much of that did you earn? <laughs> Zero, that's what, because it's unmerited. You don't have to merit. It's not based on your merit. It's based on Jesus' merit, and God gives it to you freely through faith. Okay, that's principle number two, that God's favor is unmerited. Here come number three. This is Psalm 103, 17. Psalm 103, 17 says, let me get that up on the screen. I'll read it to you. Psalm 103, 17 says, but from everlasting to everlasting, the loving devotion of the Lord extends to those who fear him and his righteousness to their children's children. King James Bible. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. It says the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. That means that God's mercy stretches from eternity past, when it was just a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost before they made anything, God gave us his mercy then, and it stretches forward to eternity future. 
at the end of the Bible where eternity begins and we live in the new world forever and ever and ever, amen. If God's mercy began back in eternity past, and if God's mercy stretches on into eternity future, that means it's not deserved. It's not based on deserve. You don't have to deserve God's mercy. Oh, you don't have to deserve it. A lot of people don't like to talk to the Lord. and A lot of people don't come to the Lord because they feel like they're not worthy. I was about to tell you, you're right. None of us are worthy. <laughs> Ain't none of us, not one of us worthy. But God does not base who he is and what he does on us. His mercy is something you don't have to deserve. And that's why at any point in your life, if you're willing to confess your sins, take responsibility for your choices and cry to God for mercy, the Lord will hear that. Because you don't have to deserve it. Okay, the very concept of mercy means you deserve something else. You did something that deserves this, but instead of that, what you deserve, God instead gives you mercy. You don't have to deserve it. Okay, all right, moving on. Next principle God's love is like sunlight, you can't increase it and you can't decrease it. You just bask in it. Oh Lord, where does it say that? That would be Psalm. 84, 11. Psalm 84, 11. Let me pull that up and put that up on the screen. Okay. Psalm 84, 11, King James Bible. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord, give, the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Okay, God's love is like sunlight. You can't increase it and you can't decrease it. You just bask in it. When you go outside, you can't increase the temperature of the sun. You can't decrease the temperature of the sun. You just bask in the sunlight. That's what God's love is like. Now, can you see by now that everything he does is based on him and his goodness and not ours? Okay, moving on, next principle. Okay. Uh, God loves you just as you are. And that is found <clears throat> in the most famous scripture in the world. What is the most famous scripture in the world? Because this is a scripture that even unbelievers know. The most famous scripture in the world is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you just as you are. Notice the Bible said, whosoever believes in him, not to special people, not to pretty people, not to young people, not to educated people. He didn't make any discrimination. That means that you no, know, regardless of who you are, you are loved by God, okay? Because he paid the exact same price for you. You never have to feel like you're less than than another human being because Jesus didn't die once for black people or once for white people or once for men or once for women. He died one time. That means he paid the same price for everybody. That means he loves you. He loves you just as you are. There is nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you any less. He just loves you. And when you really feel loved by God, you can do anything. That's the power of grasping his unconditional love. Also, I want to show you John 15 and 13. John 15 and 13. Let's read that. Okay, John 15 and 13. King James Bible. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He said, greater love, greater love has no one, no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. There's your proof that there's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. He said, I can't possibly love you anymore. I lay down my life for you. There is no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. See, there's nothing you could do to make the Lord love you anymore. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you any less. Now, can you see that once you internalize, once you believe, that you are surrounded by that kind of unconditional love, that you can do anything. When you really feel loved by God, you can do anything. There's nothing like 
knowing the love of God in a personal way and feeling like he loves you and everything I've given you is in the scripture. That's why I put the scriptures on the screen. See, this is who we're dealing with. Now I want you to contrast what I've been saying to some of the stuff you've seen in church. <laughs> Cause some of the meanest people on earth are faithful church folks. Notice I didn't mention any names, but some of the meanest people on earth, the, they the first ones at the door every Sunday. You, you understand that? That's why so many of us in our religious experiences and institutions have been hurt. But you can get past your church hurt. How do you get past your church hurt? You get past your church hurt by knowing God for yourself. That's why we have a Bible, and that's why the Holy Ghost is here with us now, because the Father and the Son are in the heavenly realm, the glory realm, but the Holy Ghost is here with us on earth, with us, yea, even in us, indwelling us. And we can get to know them because we have the Spirit and we have the Word. So if you've been hurt in church by some leader that disappointed you on any level, if they disappointed you because they failed or they said something you didn't like or they made a mistake or they stumbled or they just were wrong from the jump, you don't have to carry that church hurt for the rest of your life. You don't have to carry any hurt for the rest of your life. You know why? Because you've got an opportunity to tap into the creator and his love. And that love is greater than any love you would ever experience on earth. And it's greater than any hurt you would ever experience as well. Okay? Now, let me give you something else. And we're almost done. Let me give you something else. Okay? And the something else is in John 15 and 10. And here's the principle I want to attach to that one. The principle in John 15 and 10, which I'll read in just a second. But here's the principle. There's my sister. Hey, sis. Here's the principle. Principle is where there is love, there is no need to rebel. You understand that? Where there is love, there is no need to rebel. Let me read the scripture to you and then I'll explain that. John 15 and 10. King James Bible, if ye, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Berean Study Bible, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So just a little bit more modern English. What does that mean? Do you know why we rebel? We rebel many times because we don't feel loved. We rebel many times. Here's the main one. We rebel because we don't believe that God or whoever was our authority figure, our mother, our father, our pastor, whatever, we don't believe that they had our best interests at heart. That's what makes you rebel, if you didn't know that. Is that we did not believe that they had our best interests at heart, so we went against what they said. But when you really feel loved by God, when you know his love, there is no need to rebel. And if you have found yourself being rebellious in life, it's because you got hurt somewhere, somewhere when you were young, because someone that you should have been able to trust proved to be untrustworthy. Either they did something you didn't expect them to do, or they didn't do something you did expect them to do, and now you're hurt. And you've probably been carrying that hurt your whole life. I stopped by to tell you, God isn't like that. God said, if you keep my commandments, you live in my love. So in other words, the Lord is saying, whatever I tell you to do is equal to my love for you. My love for you, God says, is expressed in my commandments. So when I tell you to do something, says the Lord, is because I love you. His commandments are equal to his love. One more time. His commandments are equal to his love. And when you really feel loved, there's no need to rebel. Okay? That's why people spend their whole lives, quote unquote, looking for love. Okay? But they never got to know the love of the creator, the love of the maker. Because once you know his love, you know that anything he says to you is in your best interest because he loves you. So if you grew up loved by your parents, what I'm saying is, is not a big leap for you because you're used to being loved. If you did not grow up loved by your parents, then you're going to have a little further to go. You're going to have to develop this new level of relationship with God because a lot of it is brand new to you. And that's why you have so many people in church that go to church on the regular but don't know the Lord. <laughs> it's entirely possible to go to church your whole life and never really get to know the Lord. That's in the Bible. Entirely possible. 
See, because you have to develop a relationship because he's a person. Just that's why you're a person, because we are made in his image. We are made in his image. Okay. And that's why we have personalities. That's why we have souls, because God has a soul and God has a personality. You have to get to know it for yourself. That's what will heal you, uh, heal you of the hurt of this world is knowing his love. And finally, I want to give you one more principle for tonight. And then we're done for tonight. Here it is. <clears throat> Just because you don't see that kind of love down there, doesn't down here doesn't mean it's not up there. Just because you don't see heaven's kind of love down here doesn't mean it's not up there. All right. Jeremiah 31 and 3. Put that on the screen. Jeremiah 31 and 3, and I'm going to read it to you. Jeremiah 31 and 3. <clears throat> the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving devotion. King James, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me saying, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. With an everlasting love, therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Okay? You might not meet anybody here on planet Earth that loves you with an everlasting love, even the people that love you the most. Because one day you have to bury your mother. One day you have to bury your father. Okay? And the love will live on inside of you, but they gone. God's love says it's everlasting. It's everlasting. So just because you down here, what we engage in is a lot of very conditional love. People love you if they think you're attractive. People love you if they think you're popular, if you're successful, if you have money, if you're famous. You get a different response from all that than if you're not. Our love is very conditional. And that is what you get used to just being around humans. Because if you're not in, if you're not part of the in group, if you're not part of the in crowd, if you're not what's happening right now, whatever it is, if you're not a part of whoever thinks they're in, you will get treated differently. There is just no question about that. That is inarguable, okay? But God is not like that because God says his love is everlasting. It lasts forever. So what I mean by that is don't limit what God can do to what you've seen from people. Just because people cannot love you in an everlasting way, it doesn't mean that God can't. Just because you don't see that kind of love down here doesn't mean it's not up there. It doesn't mean that God can't love you that way because he can. His love, I'm a living witness that his love is everlasting. His love is everlasting. Okay? So let's recap those right quick. This is part one on our Who Is God series. And I'm going to recap all the principles I gave you tonight. Because uh, next month I'm going to do part two. So tonight, I told you God's love is unconditional, Romans 5 and 8. God's favor is unmerited, unmerited, Romans 5, 1 and 2, Ephesians 1, 2 through 8. God's mercy is undeserved, Psalm 103, uh, verse 17. God's love is like sunlight. You can't increase it and you can't decrease it. You just bask in it, Psalm 84 and 11. God loves you just as you are, John 3, 16 and John 15, 13. There's nothing you could do to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you any less. He just loves you. And when you really feel loved by God, you can do anything. Where there is love, there is no need to rebel. John 15 and 10, John chapter 15, verse 10. And finally, just because you don't see that kind of love down here, doesn't mean it's not up there. Jeremiah, 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 Jeremiah 31 and 3. Okay. That is where you want to start building the proper foundation for your relationship with God. And this is especially going out to those of you that have experienced church hurt, because a lot of people gave up on church. A lot of people just said, forget all that noise because of some things you experienced there. I have been through that. I understand that. I understand that very well. The stories I could tell you about church hurt, half of them you wouldn't believe, okay? But the way to get yourself rooted and grounded in the kingdom of God is to know the God of the kingdom. Because he said, remember, I told you, first scripture I told you was that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, 
and all of our strength. Okay. The Lord said, that's the first and the great commandment. So if that's the, <laughs> if that's the first commandment and it's the greatest one, why, why don't we, why don't churches start there? Why don't we start there in church? If the Lord said, this is first and this is greatest. This is number one and there's nothing greater than this. Why don't we start there? Why don't we start with loving the Lord with all that we have? If that's what the Lord said was first. So that's what I'm doing in my No More Genies for the next four broadcasts. Uh, the series again is going to be on who is God. Tonight was part one. So go back and watch it from the top. Uh, I'll put all the scriptures on the screen as I was reading them. So you can look at, you can look them up and read them for yourselves. But if the Lord tells us that something is first, that means we're foolish not to put it first. And if the Lord says that something is greatest, that means we're foolish. We're settling for less than the greatest if we're not doing whatever the Lord said was the greatest thing. And he said the first and greatest commandment was to love him with our entire being. But you can only love God after you have learned his love for you. We love him because he first loved us. See that? So that's where we're starting. So later for all that religious stuff, we're going to overcome our church hurt. We're going to overcome our excuses. We're going to overcome anything from the past that's been holding us down. And we're going to build a solid foundation of a relationship with God based on what his word says, not our hurt feelings, not our bad church experiences, not our childhood experiences, but what thus saith the Lord through the scripture. All right, I'm excited. So again, tonight was part one and part two, three and four is coming in the next three months. No More Genies happens on the second Thursday of every night, once a month, seven o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, okay? All right. So uh, remember, I told you that this year, my goal is to uh, increase my reach. My goal is to increase my reach because whenever a prophetic word from the Lord goes forth and whenever a prophetic teaching goes forth, <clears throat> then uh, we want to be sure as many people as possible can hear it. So I cannot do that by myself. So in every video, I'm gonna ask you to do one thing. And I'm gonna ask you to do one thing to help me get the word out. Okay, so the one thing I'm gonna ask you to do in this video is subscribe to my YouTube channel. Okay, I put it in the chat. I guess I'll put it on the screen. I don't really know if that's gonna help. I guess if you wanna copy all that. But I also uh, put how you can look me up. Okay, look me up uh, with these hashtags. And you'll find me every time. Okay, so look me up with the hashtag PDT and the hashtag NMG on YouTube. So what I want you to do is subscribe to my YouTube channel. Okay, that's the one thing I'm asking you to do in this video to help me get the word out, to help me increase my reach, to help me uh, make it so the prophetic word that the Lord is giving to me and through me can be seen by as many people as possible so they can be blessed. Because that's my goal for 2021, to increase my reach, okay? All right, amen, God bless, that's it for tonight. Thanks to all of you that joined me live. Thanks to all of you that are watching on the replay. Uh, God bless you. I uh, hope this blessing, I uh, hope this word has been a blessing to you. If you want to uh, donate to my ministry, you can uh, donate to my Zelle, uh, and that's david.taylor2 at yahoo.com. Uh, I guess I should put that there too. That's my personal. Um, if you want to sow into my ministry. Um, uh, because, you know, you're always supposed to feed what's feeding you. So uh, anything that's feeding you, you should sow into it if you're getting anything out of it. And remember, when, whatever ministry you sow into, then you will increase. So if you want to increase in your teaching anointing, when you sow into my ministry, the teaching anointing will increase for you. And if you want to increase in your prophetic anointing, when you sow into my prophetic uh, anointing, that anointing will increase for you. All right, so go back and watch this from the top and you will learn about the unconditional love of God. And this is just part one, three more parts coming. Okay, amen, God bless.
And I'll see you next time. Have a great night. And remember, there's nothing you could do to make him love you anymore. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you any less. He just loves you. Amen. And God bless. <laughs>